Good morning, everyone. This is Jerry Stevens, and uh, well, I'm presenting Shared Memory Communications over RDMA. It's an overview, just concepts and architecture. As Arnie mentioned, we'll have a follow-up in the fourth quarter, probably mid-October, where we'll talk about monitoring, display, implementation, bring up, and a lot of the details that you'll see from day-to-day -day operations. Again, we've introduced this in V2R1, and hopefully most of you have seen some of the background information or the announced material that was just recently made. Uh, so on this chart here, I'll just cover the agenda in terms of what we'll be covering. First, I would like to give you a, a brief background about RDMA itself and Rocky, a technology overview. So there will be some new acronyms for, uh, for some of you that will try to provide a brief introduction to about what that's about. And then the second topic is, of course, is this new protocol that we'll mention, Shared Memory Communications over RDMA itself, in terms of how System Z and specifically ZOS will exploit RDMA technology. And in that overview, this is where we'll cover the introduction to how this is a sockets over RDMA solution and the key quality of services that ZOS will provide for, the, for RDMA, how middleware exploits it, and we'll look at configurations, environments that can take advantage of it. And then finally, we'll also be discussing why the technology is important to System Z customers and what type of workloads benefit and uh, what the value and return on investment would be for you. Uh, on, on this chart here, we'll provide a quick overview of the RDMA technology itself and the key attributes of RDMA, what it's about. And basically, our remote direct memory access, some of you may be familiar with it, is, is a, a, an older technology in the sense that it's been in the industry for about 10 years. But for, from a networking standpoint, it's primarily been focused in the area of, an, of InfiniBand. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, what it allows you to do is for, from, it allows two discrete compute platforms to directly reference memory in another platform. So it basically allows DMA from a remote uh, standpoint using networking technology. And uh, it, but there's basically um, a couple of requirements to allow this to, to occur. And first of all, the, the, they're highlighted in this chart in green. And what they are is on the platforms, they require special adapters. We use a terminology here sometimes called RNICs, um, the already made capable network interface cards. They're basically network interface cards that have special capabilities. And then, of course, you need a network fabric that allows these cards to interconnect and switch, a switch fabric that allows RDMA semantics over that fabric. And we're going to talk about the switching and the lossless fabric that we use for uh, our interconnect for this solution, exploiting RDMA technology. On this next chart, we're going to talk about the fabric itself a little bit. RDMA over converged Ethernet, pronounced Rocky, is how System Z will exploit RDMA. On the first bullet up there, again, a little bit about RDMA itself. Again, it's, it's predominantly been used in uh, for InfiniBand networks in the high-performance computing space. But once again, it does require a, di a completely different network ecosystem, infrastructure, management structure, etc. So, so the customers, of course, would have to maintain it, both Ethernet and InfiniBand networks. RDMA, however, RDMA technology is now available on Ethernet. This has happened through extensions through the IBTA in the last couple of years. And this uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet is somewhat of a misnomer in terms of its term, but I'll talk to that in just a moment. But, but fundamentally, it just means that RDMA technology is, is now available on Ethernet itself. And so Rocky basically allows us to use your existing Ethernet fabric Existing and fund, you know, existing Ethernet switches that uh, allow us to exploit uh, RDMA technology. So we don't necessarily have to enable uh, converged enhanced Ethernet on those switches to exploit this protocol that we'll be discussing. Other protocols that exploit Rocky might require it, but SMCR does not at this point in time. So what we're seeing here now is that. Rocky is the, uh, the game changer in terms of allowing the RDMA technology to come into the Ethernet space and certainly in the Z Enterprise or in the enterprise space in general. It allows us to, to provide the technology in a more commercial aspect. Now, the third bullet talks about software and host software exploitation and how do we allow the, the software middleware to exploit the technology. And it really, there's two approaches. And in the industry, you'll see that there are several native API solutions that allows applications to exploit the hardware directly or semi-directly. Uh, 
And that has uh, quite a bit of implications, as you can imagine, in terms of matching software and managing it in, in terms of connectivity. There are several issues with that and, uh, of course, updating middleware. And then there's a second approach that's also available that uh, allows transparent application exploitation. And in this example, we're talking about uh, using standard socket API. And, and, and naturally, the, the advantages of that, of course, is time to value that simply updating your hardware and your operating system allows all of your software to immediately exploit the technology. And it's a time to value statement that, that IBM has chosen to take. On this next chart, you'll see we have an illustration of what SMCR is about, the concepts of the architecture. Here again, we show two distinct platforms. And if you, we have this notion that we have memory that we share logically across the platforms in terms of being able to access the memory from a remote platform. Once again, you'll see the new components, which is a, an already made capable NIC, along with an SMC stack that you're shown on this picture that's, that's below the sockets layer. And of course, it's transparent to the sockets layer. But, but basically, SMCR allows the applications to transparently exploit RDMA using TCP sockets uh, uh, semantics. And it is transparent. And what you'll see here now on this chart is that we have published the details. If you're interested in, on, on the specifications of the protocol, you'll see that we have a, uh, an RFC that we've published that's available that you can go onto the internet and, and review that if you'd like to look at more details than what we provide here. But IBM will, has every intention to make this protocol an open protocol and provide it to other platforms if the interest is there. But nevertheless, uh, SMCR is, a, is sockets transparent and it's provided to applications by just using TCP sockets. On chart 7, we're looking at the Z Enterprise EC12 platform in general in terms of new technology provided with the platform. And here, I won't talk about the other hardware enhancements, but just highlighting what's new in terms of communications. And basically, we have this optimized communication fabric that we're providing. And now, the RNIC that System Z will be providing will be the Rocky Express adapter, which will be introduced with the Z EC12 that we will require to exploit RDMA technology. And then the software will be provided with ZOS 2.1. And then on this next chart, this is kind of the uh, high-level overview of what SMCR has provided. And sometimes it's referred to as high-performance sockets or hypersockets like capability, but now it's across platforms. It gives you performances very similar to hypersockets. On the left-hand column of this, we, we've highlighted what our internal or micro benchmarks have been able to provide and we show with our internal testing and the numbers are very significant in terms of internal lab testing shows uh, that it, uh, RDMA technology provides two benefits. One is latency, very low latency technology in terms of network response time and we've showed workloads that could reduce the latency by 80 percent over standard Ethernet via standard TCP IP communications using on System Z would be OSA. And then lo but just below that, we show a statement about CPU savings. So in addition to latency, RDMA technology also provides a CPU savings in when you start moving large amounts of data. So basically, a lot of the message movement and receiving is, is processed by the adapter. You can view it as another type of offload. And so that becomes a factor when you're starting to move larger messages or streaming or bulking bulk data and what you'll see there is that in most cases we see up to 60 percent CPU savings and in some cases up to a 60 percent throughput savings with the RDMA and SMCR protocol versus once again everything's compared to standard TCP IP using standard Ethernet and in each case we're always comparing 10 gigabit Ethernet to 10 gigabit Rocky. Over on the right hand side of this chart this is more about the platform itself and SMCR the protocol and we're highlighting that the requirements and what's new is, of course, ZOS 2.1 introduces SMCR, and uh, ZEC 12 will introduce the new Rocky Express adapter. And we, in the RFA, we had a, a statement of direction about ZVM support. Guest support will be provided at a later time on 6.3 for guest access to the adapter. On the next chart, we we'll talk about the use cases. Who can use this and why is it valid and important to ZOS? Initially, this is ZOS to ZOS. This is introduced for ZOS 2.1. And of course, it can be for cross uh, CAC or, or same CAC, same CPC, it's just LPAR to LPAR in general. 
But the applications that will be enabled, again, is any application that uses TCP IP. They can, they can transparently benefit from the technology. And of course, uh, server communications with Kix, IMS, or DB2, anything that's intensive in terms of network I.O. or transaction-oriented will benefit from, any, from this technology in terms of uh, enablement. Uh, transaction workloads that exchange larger messages, so they're still transaction oriented, but for example, the messages it might be 32K, so maybe they're not so chatty, but the messages are larger. Again, they will benefit because a lot of the da data movement, the heavy lifting is handled by the adapter. And then, and then, of course, streaming workloads such as FTP, again, it's another example of large movement. They will benefit with the CPU and savings costs as well. And then applications that use ZOS to ZOS, TCP based that's using Sysplex Distributor, there's also uh, significant advantages for that model as well. And again, in this example, it, it, does, uh, it is unique to ZOS to ZOS only, but it's, um, it, we'll talk about why Sysplex Distributor even sees even additional advantages. And once again, the reminder is the application software are not aware of this. It's just using TCP so sockets. It's just enabled by the network administrator. Chart 10 is going to just highlight for a moment some of the performance benchmarks we have from some of our early testing. And the, the benchmarks here now, the, the numbers I referred to in the previous chart was our internal measurement. This is actually looked at as a macro benchmark where now we're no longer using test tools. We're actually using IBM middleware and we're testing more on a macro level which is multi-tier workloads. And so the first example that we'd like to highlight is uh, an example of WAS to DB2. And once again, all the numbers that we're quoting here is comparing Rocky to standard TCP IP. So this is the comparison. And once again, in the first case, it's showing the transaction from the remote client that's in this example is Linux on X using standard TCP IP into WAS Liberty. The back end was replaced with from TCP IP to Rocky back to the database using accesses to DB2. In this example we saw for this transaction that was typically three calls back to the database to complete the transaction that overall transaction time back to the client improves by 40 percent by simply improving the network connectivity back to the database. So here's an example where the overall transaction rate improves by improving the network transfer time for the database access. And you can imagine as that number of accesses increase, that percentage, of course, will also, uh, also be affected. The second example on chart 10 is uh, an example of savings we've seen with, a with actual file transfer uh, workloads. And here we're seeing a 50% CPU savings for a binary transfer between two ZOS images. Again, this is a CPU savings across the client, approximately the server. It, it, the savings are on both sides. It's an example of uh, what, and again, the, the, the fine print below has the disclaimers in terms of the environment. But once again, this is the CPU savings or moving a large file. In this example, it was a 1.2 gigabyte binary file that was transferred. But you'll see that the, here's a case of a bulk ex, uh, data transfer where the CPU savings. So again, the first example was about response time. The second example is about CPU savings. On the next chart, we have another benefit where we show an example of kicks to kicks. And as some of you may be familiar with, CICS has uh, a flows that occur between two Kix images, what they call their SIPIC uh, interface, where uh, they use distributed programming links for a distributed programming model, what they might call other Kix regions to perform work. And with this workload, we again, once again, we compare standard Ethernet TCP IP to SMCR over Rocky. And once again, for this workload, we see for Kix to Kix transactions. For the, uh, for the uh, CIPIC flows, we see a 48% reduction in response time. And because the containers in this flows were actually 32K in this example, we also start seeing, again, CPU savings. So anytime the message size increase, you're also po potentially going to see CPU savings as well. So here it's almost a 50% reduction in response time with a 10% a savings in CPU for the kicks to kicks processing. And the final example below is an example of MQ, and MQ has uh, flows that occur between two different instances of ZOS for uh, a queuing and responding to messages. And in this example, we see the transaction rate increased by about 200%. So this is a significant change for MQ messaging across two ZOS images.
again compared to standard TCP IP with Ethernet versus Rocky with SMCR. So all of the use cases we have here, that's four of them we've provided examples for macro benchmarks using actual IBM middleware with the technology on System Z using their test cases that are typical test cases that the, the various middleware teams will test with. So these are some very significant numbers. I hope it's uh, you know, gained some of your interest. And, of course, we can follow up and talk about details of those workloads. I realize your performance teams may have more questions about that. Chart 12. Chart 12 tries to illustrate the connection management and how the, the protocol connects. And once again, we're going to drill down a little bit more on the details here. We're showing two ZOS images with a TCP stack and now an SMCR stack, if you will, that basically can be viewed as two parallel stacks. And we have an IP network. And again, I want to emphasize this is a, a, a proximity technology. This is not a wide area network. You, both hosts have to have access to the same physical network to, to allow them to use RDMA. RDMA is not routable, and we'll talk about that in, 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 in more here. But, but again, here's two systems that connect to the same physical LAN. And what they will do, of course, they'll connect using standard TCP IP protocol with a TCP handshake. And in that handshake, we've uh, defined a new uh, TCP option called SMCR that we worked with the IETF to define that, that option. If both peers are enabled for SMCR, they will include that option in the th TCP three-way handshake. If they did, we'll go on to a second set of hand uh, a handshake that's very similar to what you'll see in the SSL handshake setup. The in-band, we will negotiate RDMA connectivity, and if that's, the negotiation succeeds, then we will uh, transparently and dynamically switch that connection over to use SMCR. The, app, this, the socket application uh, connection sets up, and the, the application continues to use socket semantics transparently, but the data exchange from this point on is now handled via RDMA semantics by directly referencing memory. It's a, it's a producer-consumer model where the sender produces data directly and the application using socket receive consumes the data and again under, underneath it it's done accomplished using uh, 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 RDMA. This is uh, in this figure we're trying to show that it's actually the same physical network. In our case the same 10 gigabit Ethernet network using this adapter. You still require standard Ethernet setup, so you, our OSAs are still required. In some cases, you may or may not be eligible to switch out to use RDMA, so in some cases, you'll continue using TCP IP, and we'll talk about the exceptions, but in the cases where the rendezvous is successful, then we will switch over transparently again and use RDMA. The TCP IP connection remains active and remains the controlling point for the RDMA connection. So if anything were to change in the policy or in the, or the filters that would terminate that TCP connection, the RDMA connection would also terminate. So the TCP IP connection provides state information to various endpoints and management tools. And as long as that TCP connection is active and allowed to connect to the two peers, then your RDMA connection is also active. And so on the next chart, this is just basically the information that goes with that figure. You can just view this as the note page. But again, I've talked, touched about on most of these points. Again, TCP applications exploit this transparently. It's a hybrid solution in that we use both TCP IP for management and RDMA for data exchange. So we call it, you know, refer to this as a hybrid solution using the TCP handshake. Ex ex exploiting the uh, SMCR rendezvous that was provided by the protocol. And then socket application is exchanged directly by using RDMA. Again, TCP connection remains active. And, and we'll talk about the rationale of this model. Why is this architecture? Why, why did you go down this path? And, and it'll be, it will become obvious in a, in a few minutes, but it, it does preserve many of the critical operational network management features of TCP IP. So, as you'll see the details of how you measure, monitor, trace, manage day-to-day -day of your RDMA connectivity, it, it's fundamentally an adjunct of your TCP IP management. So it, it's basically very similar. And so on chart 14, we describe that rationale a little bit. Why? Why is the hybrid protocol chosen? Again, follow standard TCP IP connection setup. That's very important for many reasons. It dynamically switches to RDMA and transparent to the application. The TCP connection remains active and idle. We can send keep alive if necessary. 
Um, it preserves a critical operational network management. This is a key point. The the day-to-day the, the -day operation is fundamentally you're just managing your IP topology. You don't provision new IP addresses. Your topology does not does not need to change. It's compatible with TCP connection lo level load balancers such as sys Sysplex Distributor. That bullet is very important because we know most of our workloads are multiple tiers that use load balancers. It's basically uh, transparent to those load balancers. And then it preserves most of the vast majority of your existing security model in terms of filters and policy, VLANs, SSL. It's not compatible with IPsec. We'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But the vast majority of anything relative to a local area network, an Ethernet LAN, your security model is preserved as is, and your IP topology is preserved. And again, so again, in terms of time to value, no application changes, reuse your existing network, and off you go. And that, that time to value is there's two key points. Is I can use the Ethernet, and I can use my, software, my application software without changing them, and that was basically the key objectives of this uh, architecture. Chart 15 describes the adapter a little bit and, and some of the requirements. So how do I use it? Again, ZOS 2.1 introduces the software, which allows you to turn on the SMCR protocol and enable that support. The hardware server requirements, it's exclusive to System Z EC12 at this driver level and be introduced with the, the BC12 as well. In addition to the uh, machine level, you would also require the, uh, the 10 gigabit Rocky Express cards that we'll be introducing. That's PCIe-based that fits into the new I.O. drawer infrastructure. Uh, ZOS will be exploiting a single port on that adapter. That 10 gigabit adapter has two ports, but an initial delivery will only exploit one port. And uh, each feature must be dedicated to a single LPAR. We'll talk about that some more, but an initial deliverable, the cards are not shareable or they cannot be virtualized. They're dedicated to a single card. And RNIC and Rocky Express, sometimes the terms are used interchangeable in this presentation, but they basically mean the same thing. Of course, Rocky Express is our branded name of that generic term. Uh, the recommended minimum configuration for an LPAR is to, to have two adapters, and that's true for any network configuration that we, we would uh, expect to have uh, hardware redundancy. It's, it's, it's uh, critical with RDMA, and we'll talk about what, why that is in a moment. But nevertheless, we always would expect you to have hardware redundancy, and in this case, it's very important. Uh, the, the system will support up to 16 features on the, on the CAC itself, and so, uh, again, that allows you up to uh, you know, 16 or possibly 8 LPARs with redundancy for that system. OSA Express is still required. OSA Express still remains strategic to the platform. In terms of how you connect or what speed or what OSA you use, it doesn't matter. You can use any of the supported OSAs, 1 gig or 10 gig. But Rocky Express, the Rocky card does require 10 gig. And uh, again, it does none of the virtualization or the implications to OSA, nothing changes in terms of OSA support at all. In fact, the OSA itself, the firmware and the, and the support within OSA, the Rocky support is transparent. All it sees is a standard TCP connection. That, of course, is uh, in terms of that connectivity flows over OSA, but the rest of it is transparent. But we do need standard Ethernet connectivity. Now, in terms of your Ethernet switch for Rocky, again, this is where the misnomer and the name comes about. But it is really all you need is a standard 10 gigabit Ethernet switch. Currently, SMCR is not enabling any of the features that require CEE to be enabled on that switch. But uh, we do require uh, global pause to be enabled on the ports that will be connected to our adapters. And that's described in an IEEE 802.3. And it's an older standard that just about every Ethernet switch, would, I believe, will have. In fact, most of them are enabled by default. But that allows us to provide better reliability on those ports with RDMA connectivity. So basically, standard 10 gigabit switch required for Rocky with global pause enabled. And some switches will refer to that, that function slightly differently, but you can, you can always look at it by that standard 802.3. Now, who's eligible to connect? On chart 16, we'll talk about eligibility. Again, both, both ZOS images would have to be enabled for SMCR. We'll talk about how you turn that on. And physical connectivity, both images must have direct connectivity to that same physical LAN. So, and we'll talk about what defines a physical LAN in just a moment, but basically it's the same physical LAN segment, typically referred to as a broadcast domain for that, that Layer 2 network. Uh, 
and we'll describe that in just a moment how, in terms of what we uh, call a physical network. But again, both, both images must have same connectivity to that same network. And then IP connectivity, basically if you're allowed to connect directly with another host, basically you have to have a connectivity to the same IP subnet. And if VLANs are used, then you'd have to have access, of course, to the same VLAN. So RDMA itself, the technology, does not support any type of uh, IP routing or routing in general. So, so you essentially you have to be able to have access to the same subnet and same VLAN. So physical connectivity and IP connectivity must be available, and you, you cannot require IPsec. So IPsec and IPsec tunnels, of course, requires IP packets, and, 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 and RDMA, the SMCR protocol itself, does not use IP, and so IPsec is, of course, not available. If the connection requires IPsec, then that's one of the reasons we would not use SMCR. Of course, you can still use SSL and, and encryption that's supported by SSL, but IP tunnels, of course, would not be supported over RDMA. So eligibility, once again, enabled for SMCR, same physical connectivity, same network, and IP connectivity, the same IP subnet. Chart 17 just illustrates this. It's just a, a drawing where you see host A and B have access to the same rocky fabric. And in this example, they're actually defined to VLAN 1 with the same IP subnet. Whereas host C is defined to a, the same hardware, the same network fabric, same LAN segment, but it has a different IP subnet and in, in this case a different VLAN. So, so host C cannot get to A and B using direct IP connectivity. It could get to them using an IP router. But what this means for, for RDMA is that uh, host A and B are eligible to use RDMA, while host C connecting to A and B would, would be required to use standard IP connectivity. So, uh, once again, you have to be able to be on the same physical network and the same have act, direct access to the same IP subnet for that TCP IP connection. So, in this example, we're showing both an OSA adapter, standard Ethernet adapter, along with a RNIC, which is our Rocky Express adapter. And on the in examples of host A and B, where they do have direct access, they would be eligible to have connections switch out and use RDMA. Host C to connect A and B would require a router, and, and of course they, that IP connection would be successful through an IP router, but not using RDMA. Let's let's just try, try to walk through this a little bit. On chart 18, we're dr drilling down in the connectivity just a little bit more detail here. The same showing these same two examples of host A and B on the left and on the right. In this example, both hosts have an OSA and a Rocky, and they both have the SMCR stack enabled. And so what happens is the first step, of course, is the TCP IP handshake occurs over your Ethernet fabric, business as usual. But if the hosts are enabled in the TCP options, they'll exchange a new option that says, I'm SMCR enabled. If both hosts exchange it on the three-way handshake, we go on to step two, which is the, the inline within the TCP IP connection, still flowing over your OSAs, are the, is the three-way handshake introduced for SMCR. We refer to it here as the connection layer level control messages that occur. Again, you can think of this, this is similar to the SSL negotiation. And what we'll do here is we'll exchange more details about our connections and our uh, eligibility, and our RDMA credentials will be exchanged. And again, if we're still eligible through that handshake, we will then go on to step three, which will now use the for the first time the Rocky adapters and we, we move to the, the link layer control messages that set up the connection between the two peers. And what we do there is we connect, creating what, what would look like just a, a dedicated point-to-point -point pipe between those two peers, and we use Q-pair technologies. A Q-pair is a send and receive set of queues that allows us to send and receive data off of an RDMA-capable NIC. And in our case, we exploit reliably connected Q-pairs. This is why we need the flow control and the Ethernet switch. You can connect the adapters directly. We don't recommend that, but certainly adapters can be connected wired directly for testing, but from a practical standpoint, we would recommend an Ethernet switch. But over this switching fabric, we'll connect a logical point-to-point -point pipe, and behind it, we'll, we'll back memory for RDMA operations but that we refer to as RMBs, or RDMA memory blocks, and we'll talk about that memory in just a moment, but certainly RDMA requires special memory. But if we go, if we step two is successful and step three we can set up that, that pipe, then we go on to step four, which allows us to switch out to use SMCR and R, in RDMA uh, operations and exchange application data, again, transparently using SMCR.
And now that that connection is established, if a subsequent TCP connection were to come along that were between the same two peers, we can reuse that pipe. And this, this RMB that you're seeing here is carved up into elements, and we will assign an element to each TCP connection. And so, so the setup is a one-time operation that occurs between the peers. When the last connection drops between those peers, we will time out that point-to-point that -point link and drop it. But initially, it's, it's a one-time setup that occurs dynamically and transparently to the applications. And then again, we'll switch out and use RDMA for the exchange of application data. And all of your existing displays, which we're going to talk about in the next presentation, in October in terms of all the NetStat and all the network management operations are all enhanced to show when you are and are not using RDMA so you can track the operations and understand and evaluate your return on your investment in terms of exploiting the technology. So that's just a real quick look at the protocol, how it sets up. Okay, chart 19, we're going to talk about a little bit lower level details now. So, so far we've talked about an overview of the architecture and the technology, but we're going to introduce some a little bit lower level of terms. We're going to talk about this notion of a link, a link group, how we use Q-pairs, and memory. Everyone, I'm sure you're anxious to understand a little bit more about this memory. What does it cost to enable this feature? How do I control it? How do I see it? We'll talk a little bit more about the architecture behind that. Chart 20 we're going to introduce this terminology that I just showed you, this notion of a point-to-point -point link. And you can think of it as, a, as basically a pipe between two peers. In this example and chart here, we're showing you that we connect two Q pairs. And they're, again, using the architecture called reliably connected Q pairs. In this example, it's Q pair 8, Q pair 64, that allows our TCP and SMC stack to work together. And we the, the red lines denote TCP connections. And once again, over this link, once we set it up, we can use multiple TCP connections can use that pipe. So it's a one-time setup, and as TCP connections come and go, we map them to this link that now serves as a point-to-point -point connection for multiple connections. And uh, we will create different links between the, the two peer hosts if necessary. There are things that will cause us. For example, if those two peers were actually connected on two different VLANs, for example, VLAN A and VLAN B, they, they would require different links and different memory solutions so they are isolated for various reasons but generally speaking it's one link between the two peers and and we'll create a different link as necessary between those two adapters so the Q pair is associated with an adapter which is associated with the user behind that uh, Q pair and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail chart 21 brings down breaks down the elements the pieces that make up a link and basically it's it's, you can think of it as a, a, a Mac or a virtual Mac on each end. And there's a global ID, which represents the, the user, if you will. It's an IPv6 link local address that we, we basically just generate from the Mac itself. We make that up. And then, of course, another aspect of the link is the Q pairs on each end. If VLANs are defined, a VLAN will also be another attribute of the link itself. So, so the, basically, you can just think of it as a is a, a grouping of the, the virtual Macs on each end with the users behind them, which is the GID, and the Q pairs themselves for access to that, uh, that fabric, and a VLAN if that qualification is there. And the peers assign and exchange uh, link IDs for easier correlation. We'll talk about that more. How does the link IDs come into play in the next session? Again, this is more the operational display and monitoring, but fundamentally it's really the Macs and GIDs that make up the links along with the Q pairs behind them. Again, the link is, is tied to a specific adapter for that virtual Mac. Now, the Q pairs, the Q pairs that we create on top of the adapters, again, represent a pair of Qs, a send Q and a receive Q, and we glue them together and we call them reliably connected Q pairs, and that forms our pipe. It allows exactly one pair of already made peers to exploit that pipe, so it's a point-to-point -point connection that's isolated for those peers. And the, uh, the adapter itself associates that link to a Q pair. So, so links are really, you can just think about them as being Q pairs. And the device driver itself, uh, it, it basically processes the units of work on behalf of the TCP stack off the uh, Q pair itself and processes them using the SMCR protocol. And so we can correlate work off of the, uh, the RMB element that I described to a specific TCP connection. So there's a one-to-one -one compare 
correlation between a TCP connection and an RMB element that's used to exchange that TCP connection's data. Now, on chart 23, we talk about one of the features that uh, differentiates SMCR in the sense that we provide uh, redundancy. We actually define something called link groups. So, in, in order to provide uh, redundancy, we, we group our links into a group that allows us to logically move data over I, uh, a pair of our NICs. In this example, we have link 1 and link 2 that's defined within a link group. And so what actually happens is when we created that first link, what we'll do is we'll dynamically set up a second link so you'll now have redundancy. And what this allows us to do, of course, is to grow the bandwidth. So now you have two 10 gig pipes and control uh, redundancy across those pipes in terms of if we lose a path, a switch, or an adapter, we can transparently move the TCP connections from one NIC to the other. So the link group technology provides quite a bit of uh, uh, qualities of services that we, we realize enterprise customers will need in terms of providing high availability and, and, and bandwidth control and over those two links. So we will attempt to balance our workloads across the two adapters so that one NIC does not perform the vast majority of the operations. And again, the link group itself can be it'll, it'll inherit the attributes of the initial link. In this case, if there's a VLAN, it'll also be part of that. And the RMBs that I mentioned, the remote memory buffers, will be, will be accessible from this link group. Chart 24 will describe a little bit more about what RMBs are. Again, remote memory buffers, RDMA memory buffers, a ZOS exploitation is we have those in fixed 64-bit uh, memory. So RDMA does require fixed memory. We put it in 64-bit virtual and backed by 64-bit real. And each peer allocates the memory that allows the other peer to write into. So basically, this is the, the notion of the architecture of shared memory. The two peers cooperate and share the access to that memory. And the sending peer basically places the TCP socket send data directly into the peer for consumption. And so my, my, my ZOS image will allocate and manage memory for my peer to use. So my peer writes into it, I consume out of it. And that's the same on the other end. So you can look at those two buffers as basically being one logical buffer for cooperation for communications across the two peers. The RMBs are then partitioned into different elements. So, so we will get uh, one megabyte buffers for our RMBs in ZOS. So every, every RMB is one meg above the bar, and it's, uh, uh, it's carved into element sizes. And the element size that we pick so we can share that RMB for multiple connections across that link is based on the TCP receive size for that connection. So, so the TCP receive size will influence how large of an RMB and basically allows, uh, the again, my sender to, to produce data into my RMB element, which is a piece of the overall RMB. So every TCP connection will have a separate, a unique element for that connection. On 25, we look at the memory a little bit. Once again, link groups. So the TCP connections denoted in the red lines across each, each adapter can be transparently and moved across either NIC based on each, each operation from the OSs. There's no affinity per se. I can move those connections. But if I do, all the connections have access to the same RMB. So in this example, if the host on the left were to write data across one RNIC in the link group, I can access RMB2 from either physical path. So the link group, again, maps two point-to-point -point connections, logically bonds the devices together, and we have remote keys that allows the Q pair to access the memory. So all memory that's associated with the link group is accessible through either path. In this example on the left, you see I have an R key 1 and R key 1 prime, which allows the peer on the right to write in, into the RMB using either of those R keys, which means I can use either path. And I have a Q pair associated in this example, Q pair 8 and 12, that also has a key that allows my other peer to access that memory. Chart 26 looks a little bit more at the ZOS specific implementation. Again, our RMBs are one meg every time we allocate one. When we bring up that link group for the first time, we will get a base supply of RMBs, and we'll get, we'll get three of them. And uh, we'll, so it's three meg each time you bring up a link group. And, and the, the RMBs are initially partitioned into different element sizes to support 
TCP connections across that, that link. And the RMB element sizes can range from anywhere to 32K to greater than 256. We can actually allocate the entire RMB to a single TCP connection in some cases. But basically, we carve those up. That's, so those buffers are static. They exist for the life of that link in that link group. And we map TCP connections dynamically to the RMBs as TCP connections come and go. And again, the TCP receive size and uh, set sock option, there are basically ways to influence the receive size. But the element that we assign to a connection is based on the receive size for that connection, either through the TCP configuration or set sock op from the application itself. We either take the default from the stack or the application can influence it. But nevertheless, we'll match that TCP connection to its best fit. We'll get a, a slightly larger RMBE for that specific TCP connection. Now, additional RMBs are allocated when all the storage is used. So RMBs, we start with that static allocation to support the RDMA pipe, and they can grow and contract as workloads come and go. But once again, you can control and limit how much you want to use overall for ZOS for RDMA activity with a new fixed mem limit that we provide in our config. But basically, RMBs is a piece of the storage that you are controlling. And simply when you run out, we just continue to use IP connectivity and not use RDMA when that occurs. So, uh, so basically, when RMBs are no longer used, we also have the ability to, again, expand and contract. So that's a dynamic value that grows with your workload and contracts as your workload contracts. On 27, we're just reiterating some of the points that here on the left we're showing that the uh, SMC link required three RMBs and the one on the right is using one. Again, it's up to the OS implementation. And ZOS will always have a base number of three. And we could grow that number and contract that number as TCP connections. You know, we could support many connections or maybe several, depending on the, uh, the nature of the workloads between those ZOS images. But nevertheless, it's a dynamic value. It is fixed memory. It's, it's above the bar. It's 64-bit for uh, ZOS's exploitations. Now, in addition to RMBs, we also have another piece of memory that you need to be aware of in terms of as you monitor and, 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 and uh, uh, look at the effectiveness of uh, RDMA. But we have something called staging buffers. They are used for outbound memory oper RDMA operations. And staging buffers allows us to stage the socket data into a, a fixed uh, buffer that allows us to uh, 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 lo use the RDMA technology to write from. And this allows us to preserve the programming model of the socket application. So basically, we will capture the data in a staging buffer, launch the write to the RDMA NIC, and the adapter takes care of that asynchronous for uh, the uh, application itself. But this allows us to not block the application. And staging buffers are just for the entire stack, not for uh, a particular TCP connection per se. So we have staging buffers for the stack and RMBs for connections. But, but collectively, the staging buffers and the RMBs are what's, what are used for outbound or inbound RDMA operations. And, and, you, and it's controlled by the new fixed memory parameter that's provided on our, in our configuration. So data is maintained in staging buffers, and the adapters will move those for us as we launch write operations. And again, the expansion and contraction can also occur. We have initial allocation of uh, staging buffers, and, we will, and a, a, we will expand those as necessary. Now, in the next chart, I'll talk a little bit about configuring SMCR. And we would like to, you know, uh, contend that the configuration is, is simplistic in the terms of you're not changing your IP configuration, your virtual networking, and, and how you achieve redundancy, and, and how, do you, how do you get an IP address or a virtual LAN? Where does this come from? That question was asked earlier. So now we'll finally talk about this. And what, what is this notion of a physical network? So once again, on chart 30, we're just re-illustrating the point of what an SMC link looks like. Again, we'll light up two Q pairs. Multiple connections use a single link. Chart 31, again, shows how we bundle links or bond adapters to create link groups so we can have redundancy and bandwidth and load balancing between the links and the adapters. We're just illustrating this once again to make a couple points. And then chart uh, 32, again, is, is trying to make the connection between uh, 
how we uh, control links and the memory behind them. So every SMC link has RMBs associated with them that are tied to just that link or link group. And all the links within a link group have access to the same set of RMBs. And again, chart 33 shows that they might not necessarily match on each OS. One OS could have a, a, a greater amount of RMBs on the other side. We, of course, we display all this. But on chart 34, we finally get to the point to illustrate what happens for uh, redundancy. And if, if with the link group te technology, it's essentially about high availability. And if we were to lose an adapter or a switch, then we will transparently move those connections over to another RNIC within the link group. And, uh, and we do not disrupt the, the application workloads. They continue. And we just we would move those back, or I'm sorry, we would basically when the adapter would recover and come back, we would start using the second uh, recovered adapter again, and we would start provisioning t new TCP connections to the new uh, link when it recovers, and we will eventually get back to a balanced set. We don't proactively move the connections back, but we will balance them as TCP connections come and go. So basically what happens here is that once again the applications they're not aware of which path we're using the architectures allows the operating system to switch based on various stimulants based on load based on availability etc ZOS we only currently only move our connections based on an unavailable link so this provides transparent high availability to the application middleware so the TCP connections are not disrupted instead we just use the RDMA operations on another NIC and now, how you enable SMCR in terms of ZOS, in the global config, we have a new parameter, and you'll, the, the term is PCI function identifier, and you can think of PFID as like a chip it, for example, and you must specify the, the PFID that you would like um, ZOS to use, and the PFID is just another way to identify the specific Rocky adapter, and so the things you have to do is enable SMCR and give us at least one PFID. So on the global config, you tell us uh, what PFIDs you would like us to use for this COS image. And again, we would recommend that you would use two for each physical network that you're going to exploit to have that redundancy. And so for, for ZOS, of course, we support multiple stacks. And for each global config in those stacks, you can enable SMCR at a global statement. I'm turning it on for the entire stack. Now, at the interface level, you do not have to do anything, but you could uh, control it on per interface. Like on VLAN A, I'd like to use RDMA. On VLAN B, I want to disable SMCR. So you can turn it on on a per interface level, and that interface is basically where we'll get the attributes for the Rocky interface. So we're finally going to talk about this IP address a little bit. And, and then the question becomes, okay, if I have a dozen OSAs, this COS has, how does it know, how do you bond the OSAs and the Rocky adapters together? How do you pair them up? And we're going to talk about that in, in a moment. But, but, but for now, I want you just to capture, I, all I did was, after I did my HCD configuration of the adapters, I have to define them in HCD. Once I did that for TCP, all I did was turn on SMCR on the global config and specify the PFIDs that I want to use and you're up and running, SMCR should be usable. Now, in terms of high-level operations, we, we once you start uh, SMCR on a capable OSA, in other words, it's an interface that you did not disable it on, then we will find the appropriate PFIDs and use them dynamically. So because you had two adapters, the ZOS Com Server Design was very uh, specific about trying to minimize operations. In other words, we did not want you starting, stopping, multiple NICs. We basically just... Uh, we try to provide the operations completely through OSA. So in other words, you operate OSA in the RNIC, just inherit and come along and follow your uh, OSA operations. And so basically over an OSA where we have a TCP connection that, that's eligible for uh, SMC, we will basically find the appropriate Rocky adapter and use it for using RDMA. And we're going to talk about how we bond them in just a moment. But when you, when you terminate TCP connections that's using the SMCR link, we'll, again, we'll drop the link if no new TCP connections come along. You can explicitly stop Rocky interfaces, but you, you, there's no requirement to do that. It would, would basically come down with your OSAs itself. Again, starting and stopping OSA fundamentally controls the Rocky interfaces. So if you stop the last SMCR OSA interface, we will also stop the, uh, the RDMA interface as well, the Rocky adapter.
this is illustrated on chart 37. So once again, you're, you're fundamentally defining OSA, an IP address for the OSA interface, and the Rocky interface is transparently activated, dynamically used, and the question about where does my IP subnet come from? Well, it comes from your OSA interface statement, and it inherits all the attributes of VLAN, the subnet, etc., comes from your OSA. So you can look at this logically as one interface, one physical interface, but of course physically it's two, but we logically bond them together, and we, and all the operations and the network attributes are inherited from your Ethernet interface statement and your OSA behavior, operationally speaking, of course accessing the same physical network. Now, how we choose which adapters to bond, we're going to talk about in just a minute in terms of which adapters do we pick. But the RNIC interface is basically, it's a PFID defined on the global config. That's really all you did. And the, the COM server code will basically find the appropriate adapter, build. We still use the TRLE model for representing the adapter, but it's dynamically built. You don't define TRLEs. It's created for you. You don't define interface statements. All you did is define the PFID, the PCI function identifier that you define in HCD, the COM server, that tells us which adapters you'd like us to use. And then again, as you operate OSA, we will bring up and bring down the uh, Rocky interfaces that's controlled from uh, the operations of the OSA itself. Now finally, chart 39, we'll talk about the uh, this notion of physical networks. Now we created something called a physical network identifier. We introduced this concept. It's a hardware attribute. So you have to think of it as a physical attribute of the card. And when you install the card and you make a decision about what network you're going to plug it in, it's just an administrator-defined identifier. This could be network A. I'm going to define an identifier that I, I, I need to now define on both my OSAs and my uh, Rocky cards. And we will basically pair up OSAs that have the same physical network identifier that's defined by the, the administrator. So in the HCD definitions or your IOCDS, you need to now define PNET ID, and it's a positional parameter. You'll see when you go into HCD that, well, there are multiple PNET IDs that are allowed. What's, what, what is this about? And it's positional. Each PNET ID represents the identifier of the physical port. In some cases, the adapter may have multiple ports. Uh, OSA 1 gig, for example, has, could have two ports. And so each PNET ID is for the port, the port associated with it. So the first one would be for port 0 of OSA, and the second identifier could be for port 1 of OSA. On Rocky, the port numbering is actually port 1 and 2. Now, for ZOS COM server, we're only going to exploit one port at a time. You can use both ports, but only one at a time. But nevertheless, in HCD, we would recommend that you define both of them, and you could move back and forth as necessary. If you have opters or transceiver issues, you could simply move to the other port. But the PNET ID is the identifier of the physical network associated with a physical NIC and the physical NIC's port defined in HCD. Now, all the operating systems in the firmware and System Z, they just dynamically learn that identifier through traditional means of learning the hardware configuration. So now, <clears throat> now the software learns about PNET IDs, and it'll, it will then query and find the PNET ID for the given adapters, and we start pairing them up. So again, you do not configure PNET ID for Rocky, it'll fail. If you do not configure a PNET ID for uh, OSA, it will, it will continue to be used, but that OSA interface will not be eligible for RDMA. We, we pair them up using the PNET IDs. And on chart 40, we illustrate this. Here in this example, there are three distinct physical networks that are, represent distinct uh, LAN segments. Physically, they each are a broadcast domain that are distinct from each other. In this example, networks A, B, and C. The hardware administrator, when you define the cards, the cards are, the Rocky cards are described here as the kind of the gold, the yellow color. But now the administrator goes in and defines a PNET ID for each of the OSAs, which are kind of in the gray here, along with the uh, yellow, which are the Rocky cards. And now as the operating systems come and go, they will bond these adapters based on having like PNET IDs. And so, for example, if I have PNET IDs for OSA for NET-A and Rocky cards with PNET IDs in NET-A, I will bond them together and allow them to be used by the OS. In this example, you see this is how we group or pair adapters based on having like network identifiers. Again, it's defined in HCD. 
And as, as, as our internal ESP accounts, no matter how long we spend on this chart, somebody's going to try to start OSA without a peanut ID, and they won't, they won't get RDMA, and they're going to ask us, I can't get Rocky or SMCR to start, and, and they're going to have forgotten to define peanut ID on either the Rocky card or OSA. So again, it has to be defined and has to match in order for us to use that. Chart 41, we illustrate that processing. Again, this was an attempt to minimize the configuration and operations in the operating system. So you can imagine if, if we put this in software configuration, it would be very cumbersome to keep this straight. But essentially, you just here we're showing the TCP config on the left and the VTAM config on the right where you define OSAs. And again, you're just it, it uses your existing OSA definition in, in comm server. And uh, if you, you simply start the OSA interfaces from the TCP stack, and the rest of it is dynamic, but you, you do have to turn on SMCR and define the PFIDs that you want us to use, and we'll pair, we'll do the matching and pairing based on network IDs. In this example here, I have PFIDs 100 and 200 defined, and three, oh, actually, uh, I have six of them defined. I can, it defaults to port number one on the Rocky cards, or you can explicitly specify it, which port you would like us to use. And then there's the corresponding interface statements that's also part of the TCP config. And then on the right, there's the OSA definition with a port name, for example. And we know we start the interface. And when you do that, what you'll see is that we will start OSA. We'll say, ah, this OSA has net A defined as a PNET ID. And this stack has SMCR enabled. And then I will, the first OSA that's enabled for, um, with an SMCR enabled in the stack, we will activate all of the defined PFIDs. We won't use them. We won't back them with any of this fixed memory yet, but we will activate them and learn their PNETs. In this example, you'll see, ah, I've got these six PFIDs defined, and they have different net IDs. I have two of them for net A, C, and B. But in this first OSA example, it had a PNET ID of A, and so what we'll do is we'll pair it up with PFID 100, and uh, we see that OSA... Uh, for uh, port name 2, the second tier of Lee, that OSA chip it also has net A. And again, so now we'll bond those OSAs with PFIDs 100 and 200. And so those two interface statements, interface statement 1 and 2, for their IP addresses and their VLANs will all be inherited for any RDMA connectivity. So finally, we answer the question, where'd you get the IP address from? The subnet came, it will come off of this interface statement. Subnet mask must be configured. Okay, so this chart here is just trying to show how, from a definition and operational standpoint, you're simply starting OSAs, we discover the PNET ID, we discover the PNET IDs on the PFIDs you defined on global config, and we just logically bond the adapters and use the connectivity as necessary. But as, as asked here, I could have many interfaces for net A, interface statements for net A, and uh, I'd still use the same two rocky PFIDs as necessary and the eligibility statement occurs during the rendezvous process to find out if both peers have access to net A and to the same subnet. But in this example, we, we have two interface statements for the same physical network, and this is all about illustrating physical connectivity, not IP connectivity, on chart 44, in terms of how we pair up adapters. But, but it's not, not describing how many interface statements I might have. You could have many but typically you would have uh, one for each uh, subnet or possibly redundant for each subnet. So again, operating your OSAs, we will just dynamically find the Rocky adapters and switch out and use any adapter that has the same physical connectivity. And so I know that takes a little bit of time to absorb. It's very new, and that's why we'll have the follow-up session in October to describe this in a little bit more detail, where you'll actually start seeing displays net stat and live information in terms of how you monitor and verify, verify what path it used and why it does or did not use SMCR. Uh, chart 45 is a quick chart about talking about interactions with TCP functions in terms of how we integrated SMCR with the qualities of services of the ZOS TCP IP stack and things like SysPlus distributor, various security functions like ATTLS, IDS, and IP, IP security, and MLS. And, uh, how the, the notion that TCP applications have sockets compatibility, in other words, it's completely socket compliant in terms of the socket calls that occur over the existing APIs are supported relative to uh, uh, SMCR.
and a little bit about Fricka in terms of what happens if you enable that. On chart 46 is a little bit about S uh, Sysplex Distributor. This is a key concept. Again, the SMC architecture, all the way back to the first couple charts, we, we claimed is transparent to the uh, load balancers that sit in between us, which could be Sysplex Distributor. These are connection level load balancers, or it could be an external load balancer. But the point is, is that the TCP connection flows through that load balancer. And the way Sysplex Distributor is implemented is that, and of course, this is ZOS to ZOS in this deliverable. So the client would have to be a ZOS host and would have to be enabled for SMCR. And again, uh, the Sysplex Distributor client's not running on ZOS platforms would continue to use normal TCP IP, of course, because both peers must be enabled. And TCP connection is set up using the rendezvous processing that we described before. And once the TCP connection is established, the, the rendezvous processing term, uh, determines which SMCR link or adapter to use. And then, of course, it uses the uh, it exchanges application data using RDMA. And then at that point, this last bullet on this chart is very important. It, once we set up that connection and switch out to use RDMA between the two images, we no longer traverse the Sysplex distributor stack for exchanging data. So there's no packets. The RDMA SMC protocol does not send or build or transmit TCP or IP packets. It's using RDMA semantics. And so not only is it transparent and, and compatible with Sysplex distributor, is once you establish a connection, the distributor host is out of the path. And so that's a very important performance improvement. As you know, in, in the past, on chart 47 here, we'll examine how it used to work. As you know, that we had this QDI accelerator function that tried to minimize the cost of going through TCP for, for data traffic. And now uh, with the RDMA processing, once we set up that connection between the two ZOS endpoints, between the originating host and the target stack the distributor, is now out of the path for the RDMA transfer of data. And so not only do we not use the accelerator, we don't use the distributor at all for data transfer. That TCP connection is still active, and the distributor is aware of it. Some load balancers will require Keep Alive. You can turn on Keep Alive if necessary. But as far as it looks like a static connection and the data is exchanged out of band using direct memory access uh, semantics again. So hopefully that makes sense to you. I know it's, a, it's quite a bit, but the point is, is that not only is it compatible, it's a, it represents a performance improvement in terms of this, this middle host. And that's for any load balancer in, in general. So again, the RDMA connection is point to point. Chart 49 just tries to illustrate how we integrate SMCR with security functions. And again, get in connection level security, SSL or TLS or ATTLS are all compatible and transparent to uh, SMCR itself. IP filters, traffic regulation, IDS, for the most part, are also compatible. And so basically you're, you're seeing here is how we integrate the, the various functions along with uh, SAF based network resource controls, net access, stack access, uh, as well. The, the, the one part that is different is, of course, IPsec tunnels are not supported. There's no IPsec, there's no IP packets. And of course, if you require IP tunnels, IPsec tunnels, then you cannot use RDMA and uh, SMCR for, uh, for this connection. But for the other connection level and uh, access controls and filters that are related to a connection, they are compatible. Chart 50 just reiterates this a bit. ATTLS can be deployed and used with SMCR. For the applications that use it, uh, you know, it will continue to use and be eligible. It can encrypt or use authentication as it does today. And uh, it will continue to use SMCR because it's connection. And this is, this is also true with applications using TLS or SSL directly. They, again, connection level security is compatible with uh, SMCR. Intrusion detection services at SMCR, there are some compatibility, scan detection, and traffic regulation, of course, is still, uh, no, there's no special interaction or change. Detection reporting, prevention of attacks related to socket data applied to TCP connection uses SMCR. Uh, we, we still use some of the constrained queue events, normal constraint apply, uh, global TCP stall events, etc. Uh, also apply. T TCP connection also considered to be constrained when data was stored into the RMB but is not acknowledged within 30 seconds, so we also integrate that, that constraint as well. Um, also, security functions that do not interoperate with SMCRs on chart 52, again, uh, IPsec, MLS are not compatible. These require an actual TCP IP uh, packet or flows at that level. 
And again, those functions are not compatible. And again, if the connection requires it, we'll continue to use TCP IP as opposed to RDMA. If you are using uh, FRICA, which is the Fast Response Cache Accelerator function, that is not compatible with SMCR. And, uh, and so if, if the connection requires FRICA, then we'll continue to use TCP IP. In terms of socket semantics, SMCR is socket compatible, supports uh, all socket APIs except for the Pascal sockets. And all the, uh, uh, the socket calls for TCP socket for the APIs are all supported. And some of the, un uh, the, some of the slightly different ones are message weight all, peak, urgent data, and the accept and receive calls are all, again, compatible with SMCR. So we're not aware at this point of any incompatibility with applications in terms of socket semantics compatibility with SMCR. Again, it cannot be used with FRICA. You will, will opt out for that case as well. And finally, on chart 54, this is a summary of what SMCR provides. And again, the, the, the number one thing on this list is optimize network performance and leveraging RDMA technology. We've given you kind of a sound bite of what level of performance can you expect by using RDMA. And again, those numbers were quite significant that, uh, that we uh, showed on the beginning. But the key part is the optimized communication. Uh, second is transparent to the application software, so the middleware does not change or is not disrupted. It's, it's transparent and compatible with socket semantics. We're leveraging your existing Ethernet. Now, we say existing, of course, it does require 10 gigabit, and you can enable Rocky over a 10 gigabit fabric, so you would just need a switch that supports 10 gig with, again, global pause enabled. But what we'd like to say is those two bullets are very important applications do not change and your network infrastructure is essentially reused and it preserves your existing network security model so most of the attributes the vast majority and relative to uh, LAN segments and VLANs and subnets are all preserved again RDMA is not available for uh, IP routers so as long as you have direct access to that same IP subnet you can use RDMA in terms of resiliency, we've provided that through dynamic failover through redundant hardware. So as long as you provision multiple adapters, the SMCR and the comm server exploitation will exploit those for, for load balancing across those adapters and for redundancy for failover cases. The transparency to the connection level load balancers that might sit between the two OSs, the SMCR again is transparent to those. The TCP connection still sets up. For state management, you still can see the connection. But again, we'll, we'll switch out a band to use RDMA for a data exchange. And then finally, the IP address and IP topology of your adapters it essentially inherits your existing topology. And uh, you do not need to provision or change your IP networks. You, you certainly could. You could provision new networks for RDMA, but it's not required. So it does preserve and use your existing day-to-day -day administrative and operational model in terms of how you manage, administer, monitor your network and your IP topology is all preserved. So collectively, this uh, provides a significant qualities of service in terms of being able to gather and use, exploit RDMA, and still maintain these qualities of services that's provided through the SMCR protocol provided by ZOS. And, uh, and then I know that in addition to the information that we provide, this is an introduction to the concepts of the RDMA and the exploitation by ZOS. We also have a frequently asked question document that you'll see here on this website that we hope that if there's something in here that wasn't clear that you can go to this document it's available on the web that will answer and provide additional background the additional questions you might have. If you have a question that's not in that document we'd also like to know about that so that we can address it so that as, as customers start having additional questions we can capture them in a single repository. So once again this was an introduction. We'll follow it up um, with a detailed presentation in, Oct in, in October that will go into the displays, the actual configuration, this monitoring memory and controlling it, and look at some of the aspects of actually using the function on ZOS. And uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that. And uh, any questions or feedback that you have on this overview, we would also would like to uh, follow up with you as well.